The Hoover Presidential Library has hosted many exhibits over the past years. It would be very difficult for us to choose a favorite one. The interest generated by the present exhibit of Laura Ingalls Wilder has far surpassed all of our expectations. And because of that, we've decided to film it. This picture is of the famous author, Laura Ingalls Wilder, in 1937. She was 70 years old, and she was in the middle of writing her famous books. Next to her is Rose Wilder Lane, her daughter, a journalist, an author in her own right, and the collaborator with Laura on the Little House series. Just as Laura had pieced together quilts to keep her family warm in the winter, she also pieced together the memories of her childhood to keep her past alive. She did not begin writing the story of her life until she was 60 years old, but the patchwork of her memories was vividly colorful and resulted in the Little House series that children and adults have come to love so dearly. And here we see Laura hugging Pa at night just before she would drift off to sleep. Pa symbolized safety for them. She knew if she could hear a pause fiddle in the background, that all was right. Well, let's meet this famous family and its beginnings. Here we see Charles Ingalls. He was born in New York. He was the third child of 10 in the Ingalls family. They will emigrate to Illinois and then later on to Wisconsin, where they will settle next to the Quiner family. And years later then, Caroline Quiner and Charles Ingalls will become the famous couple known the world over as Pa and Ma Ingalls. Here we see a portrait of, taken up in 1894 of the entire family. Of course you will recognize Pa and Ma, the famous author Laura, and over in the right hand corner you see Mary sitting in a chair, baby Grace is standing next to her all grown up, and over by Ma is Carrie, and that makes up the famous family. Well, when Pa and Ma were married, they first lived with Charles' family, and then when they could afford a home of their own, they moved north of Pepin, Wisconsin, and built probably one of the most famous homes in the entire world, the little house in the big woods. And so the story begins. Once upon a time, 60 years ago, a little girl lived in the big woods of Wisconsin in a little gray house made of logs. And the great dark trees of the big woods stood all around the house. And beyond them were other trees, and beyond them were more trees. There were no houses, there were no roads, and there were no people. There were only trees and the wild animals who had their homes among them. Laura Elizabeth Ingalls was born on February 7th in 1867 in Pepin, Wisconsin. Her parents were pioneers who moved their family of daughters throughout the Midwest, looking for fresh starts and free lands. Laura had fond memories of her childhood and all the things that her parents had done for her. And I'd like you to hear them in Laura's own words. I began to think what a wonderful childhood I'd had had, how I'd seen the whole frontier, the woods, the Indian country of the Great Plains, the frontier towns, the building of the railroads on wild and settled country, homesteading and farmers coming in to take possession. Then I understood that in my own life, I represented a whole period of American history, that the frontier was gone and agricultural settlements had taken its place when I married a farmer. I wanted the children now to understand more about the beginning of things, to know what is behind the things they see, what it is that made America as they know it. That was in Laura's words from a speech that she gave in 1937 at the age of 70. Laura was a storyteller herself, and she always cherished the stories that Pa had told her as she was growing up. Pa would always keep them safe and warm. He would trap rabbits and salt their skins down and nail them to the log cabin wall so that in the winter time he could make warm, snug hats for his little girls. And Ma was always there at night to keep the girls safe. This case represents the little house memories, and in each case you will see a quilt. The quilts did not belong to the Ingalls or the Wilder families, but they are of the period. Quilts were very important. They kept the families warm in the wintertime. You can see here a piece of Grandpa's shirt 
and over here is a piece of her daughter's first dress. Quilts were living histories, and that's exactly what Laura was doing in her stories. This fiddle is typical of those used by the frontier musicians, and Pa's fiddle was one of Laura's favorite memories. Pa's fiddle music could create an instant party to entertain his family or play soothing hymns to give them strength during difficult times. Mary and Laura were always playing together, and here we see them in the second story of the log cabin. And they're sitting on pumpkins and squash, and they're playing with found objects. Mary was lucky she had a rag doll, but Laura had just a corn cob named Susan, wrapped in Pa's handkerchief, and Laura loved her very much. And then one magical Christmas, Charlotte arrives, and Laura had a real rag doll to love. The realities of pioneer life could be very harsh, as seen in the winter of 1880 to 81, was a fierce one on the plains of South Dakota. No trains could get to Desmet where the Ingalls lived and the food was scarce. And when fuel ran out, the settlers burned prairie grass on their wood stoves. And here we have a hay twist or a hay stick. The realities were also harsh when it came to the health of young children. Mary will have scarlet fever when she's 13 years old and she will be blind. Laura will sew and Laura will become a school teacher, something she didn't want to do, but she did it to help Mary be able to go to Vinton, Iowa for the School of the Blind. And Mary will graduate there after eight years of attendance. And this is a letter that Mary wrote home with the aid of a school teacher and a ruler. Laura Ingalls will fall in love with Almanza Wilder and they will be married on August 25th, 1885, in DeSmet, Dakota Territory. Laura will nickname him Manly, and he will call her Bess, after her middle name, Elizabeth. Their only child, Rose, will be born in December of the following year. And then, in 1889, the Wilder family home will catch fire and burn to the ground. Laura will escape with Rose and the deed box. A few other items, including the silver spoon, were rescued by a neighbor. The silver set was Almanzo's wedding gift to Laura. In 1888, Laura and Manley were both stricken with diphtheria. Almanzo suffered a small stroke in conjunction with the disease, and his feet never regained full mobility. Because of Almanzo's health, the Wilders moved to Mansfield in southern Missouri, where the winters were milder. Mansfield would be Laura and Almanzo's home for the rest of their life. After Laura and Almanzo Rose moved to Missouri in 1894, they settled on Rocky Ridge Farm and set out to make a living. Laura was quite successful at raising chickens and was often asked to share her secrets on getting hens to lay eggs. Once in 1911, when she could not keep an engagement to speak at a meeting of farm women, she sent a handwritten copy of her speech to be read. The editor of the Missouri Ruralist, who happened to be in the audience that day, asked Laura to contribute to the magazine. And with that, the writing career of Laura Ingalls Wilder was born. Laura became a regular contributor to the Missouri Ruralist, in which she had her own regular feature called, As a Farm Woman Thinks. In 1925, Laura published My Ozark Kitchen in Country Gentlemen, a monthly magazine considered a step up in the national publishing world. When she moved to the Rocky Ridge, she originally wanted a small, modern kitchen resembling the ones in women's magazines, but she later wrote, I had not realized that a farm kitchen must be more than merely a kitchen. It is the place where house and barn meet, often in pitched battle. All of the objects in this case belong to Laura. This was her white cotton dress, with matching shoes. This was her black hat, her sewing basket. She enjoyed doing needlework. And this was a place setting of her good china. Notice the floral pattern of roses. And while I'm speaking of roses, let's look at the next case that's dedicated to her daughter. Rose Wilder was born in Desmet, Dakota Territory on December 5th, 1886. When she was eight years old, her family moved to Mansfield, Missouri, where they toiled to make a living on Rocky Ridge Farm. Rose later said she never really fit into the world of Southern Missouri. 
When Rose was a little girl, she owned a donkey, and that's how she got to school. But she described him as a stubborn, fat little beast who liked to slump his ears and neck and shoulders suddenly when going downhill and tumble her off over his head. After graduating from high school, Rose took a job as a Western Union Telegraph operator in Kansas City. It was probably at this job that Rose learned to type, a valuable skill for a writer. Rose moved to San Francisco in 1908, and less than a year later, at age 22, married Claire Gillette Lane. This marriage did not last. Rose would become a world traveler. She would travel throughout Europe and the Near East. She was also a journalist and an author in her own right. She wrote the first biography of, of President Hoover in 1920, titled The Making of Herbert Hoover. Her most famous book was Let the Hurricanes Roar, and it was serialized by the Saturday Evening Post. This is the mahogany desk where Laura sat while writing the Little House books. On the desk is the tablet of the manuscript for the first four years. Laura was 63 years old when she began the Little House series. She hand wrote all of her manuscripts and her daughter Rose typed them and offered suggestions and they worked together to refine Laura's style and make her a better writer. This became an editing pattern that carried on through the writing of all the Little House books. And in 1932, after many revisions and several title changes, Little House in the Big Woods was released to the public and the legacy of the Little House books began. In 1894, Laura and Al Manzo purchased their farm in Mansfield, Missouri for $400. The land was much rockier than the farmland in Dakota Territory, so it was fitting that Laura should name the farm Rocky Ridge. They were able to survive on the farm without going into the debt that had chased them from Dakota Territory. Laura and El Manzo worked as equal partners. They had an apple orchard, El Manzo kept a herd of milk cows, and Laura tended the chickens that made her a local celebrity. El Manzo's health was better in the milder winters of Missouri, and he and Laura loved the Ozarks. This photo of Laura and El Manzo was taken the year before these happy golden years was published. Laura was 75, and El Manzo was 85 when they posed in the yard of the Rocky Ridge Farmhouse. El Manzo died in 1949 at the age of 92, and Laura continued living on the farm until her death in 1957. These three place settings of Laura's glass dishes are on loan from the Loringles Wilder Museum and home in Mansfield, Missouri. The pattern on the dishes is called the cabbage rose, and Laura got them out of boxes of oatmeal. In this room, we have scenes taken from Laura's books. To my left is a scene taken from The Little House in the Big Woods. Behind me comes from by the shores of Silver Lake, and over here we have a cutting from these happy golden years. Ma and Grandma cleared away the dishes and washed them and swept the hearth, while Aunt Dosha and Aunt Ruby made themselves pretty in their room. Laura sat on their bed and watched them comb out their long hair and parted carefully. They braided their back hair in long braids, and then they did the braids up carefully in big knots. They fussed for a long time with their front hair, holding up the lamp and looking at their hair in the little looking glass that hung on the wall. They brushed it so smooth on each side of the straight white part that it shone like silk in the lamplight. The little puff on each side shone too, and the ends were coiled and twisted neatly under the big knot in the back. Then they pulled on their beautiful white stockings that they had knit of fine cotton thread and lacy openwork patterns, and they buttoned up their best shoes. They helped each other with their corsets. Aunt Dosia pulled as hard as she could on Aunt Ruby's corset strings, and then Aunt Dosia hung under the foot of the bed while Aunt Ruby pulled on hers. Then Aunt Ruby and Aunt Dosia put on their flannel petticoats and their plain petticoats and their stiff starched white petticoats with knitted lace all around the flounces, and they put on their beautiful dresses. Next, we will see the Ingalls family at the train depot from by the shores of Silver Lake. When the time came, Laura could hardly believe it was real. The weeks and months had been endless, and now, suddenly, they were gone. Plum Creek in the house and all the slopes and fields she knew so well were gone. She would never see them again. 
clean and starched and dressed up in the morning of a weekday, they sat in a row on the bench in the waiting room while Ma brought the tickets. In an hour, they would be riding on the railroad cars. Ma lifted Grace on her arm, and with her other hand, she took tight hold of Carrie's. She said, Laura, you come behind me with Mary. Be careful now. Bumps and crashes ran along the freight cars and flat cars, and they stopped moving. The train was there, and they had to get into it. The next scene is taken from Slays on Main Street from these happy golden years. That Sunday afternoon, the weather was even more beautiful. Again, the sleigh bells were ringing and laughter floating on the wind. Suddenly, a ringing of bells stopped at the door. Before Kapa could look up from his paper, Laura had the door, and there stood Prince and Lady with a little cutter, and El Manzo stood beside it, smiling. Would you like to go sleigh riding, he asked. Oh, yes, Laura answered. Just a minute, I'll put on my wraps. Theirs was one of the line of sleighs and cutters swiftly going the length of Main Street, swinging in a circle on the prairie to the south, then speeding up Main Street and around in a circle to the north, and back again and again. Far and wide, the sunshine sparkled on the snowy land. The wind blew cold against their faces. The sleigh bells were ringing, the sleigh runners squeaking on the hard-packed snow. And Laura was so happy that she had to sing. The legacy of the Little House book stretches far and wide. The volumes have been translated into many languages, and they are enormously popular. It's been estimated that over 60 million of Laura Ingalls Wilder's books have been sold worldwide, and even more people have seen the television show based on them. Almost immediately after the publication of her first book, Laura began receiving mail at her home in Mansfield, Missouri. The Wilders purchased the largest mailbox that they could find, and it was often filled with letters. In 1953, Harper's released a new set of Laura's books illustrated by Garth Williams. Mr. Williams autographed this copy of one of the many soft pencil drawings, which added warmth and charm to the Little House books. Laura Ingalls Wilder's childhood was a vivid picture in her memory. She remembered a time of strong family ties, the rugged pioneer life on the prairie, moving from place to place, the friends she made, her school days, and the many activities that kept her busy. And her stories live on.